Sup everybody, this is Carrick with ACG, and as always, it's my continuing mission to give you reviews that aren't two minutes long or filled with sponsored bullcrap. You know, right now they say that almost 70% of people hate their job in America. Guess what? I'm all 30% on the other side because today I'm reviewing Ace Combat 7 Skies Alone from Bandai Namco for the PS4 and Xbox One. It's out on January 18th and Windows on February 1st. And of course, Ace Combat continues the series' wacky story. What fighter jet game with an arcade base wouldn't have the lead character's name be Trigger? And here, Trigger is fighting for their land. And Namco's never settled for the Ace Combat games to just be about two jets hightailing it through smoke thicker than Kenny Loggins' 1986 mullet gel. Instead, you're quickly and falsely accused of an attack. And for that, you're sent to a jail, then promptly put right back into a jet in the world's fastest criminal rehabilitation treatment plan ever seen. It's been more than 10 years since the last new Ace Combat game came to us. Let's see how this one does, shall we? As always, if you like the video, maybe subscribe. So here's my review for Ace Combat 7, Skies Unknown. Screw the hard deck, digital Kelly McGillis, and the satisfaction of sending enemy pilots into the spirit zone. Graphics are up first. And Ace Combat looks good. How good? At a distance, it may not be the most enviable of titles, though the environments look stunning. But the first time you get up close and hangry into the back end of an enemy MiG and turn him into a Death Blossom only to then fly right through what's a mix of jet fuel, human innards, and vehicle parts, you realize just how impressive a reflection of explosive violence this game is. Then take that moment and multiply it by about 24 in the larger fights, and it's like flying through a New York fireworks display at mock speed and the fireworks somehow want to eat you. Really, the game is stunning, from incredibly soft-looking volumetric clouds that dot some of the levels to the couple of insane bosses that Ace Combat has always been known for. The game strives for an over-the-top presentation of air combat while still extolling some of the virtues of a more realistic lighting system. Now, this results in an almost hyper-realistic look. Think Red Dead Sunsets, and you sort of get the idea in some of these levels. All the 20-plus jets are finely modeled, and the first time you pull a hard G during a turn and the air condenses across the wing mixed with that shake and rattle of the stress put on the parts, it is awe-inspiring. And yes, you still have Missile Cam, where you can hold on to the fire button and trace forward with your missile, watching it slam into the enemy's structure or missing by a hair's breadth. And I think they did a perfect balance here, where Ace Combat skirts the line in its ability to shower you with otherworldly effects that most realistic games don't. Real airplane combat many times is actually an inches game played outstretched into hundreds of miles with missiles launched prior to eye-to-eye -eye contact with the opposing force. But not Ace Combat. Ace Combat shrinks the encounter space to a tightened ring of anarchy painted into the sky by missiles whispering by you every second, and you hammering back and forth between positive and negative Gs like you're balancing a checkbook. It's not a sim, never pretends to be a sim, and instead offers an almost dead or alive versus virtual fighter kind of stance in the airplane combat department. But that doesn't mean it's all high flying turning and burning excellence here. There is some elbow grease showing. First, the train, while much better than past entries, does have a couple pop in issues that are very noticeable on ground focused missions. Also, unlike planes, it seems like all the ground elements have one skin change between perfectly fine and completely fucking dead. And you can see that many times while playing and taking out any non-flying enemies. Additionally, the anti-aliasing, or really lack of it, is a bit noticeable here with some shimmering across a number of flat, played out jet parts. It's not horrid, it's just sometimes a little bit odd looking. Also, when flying in the clouds, for some reason, both in-game and in the replays, your cockpit is not affected by the clouds, resulting in what looks like this flying cylinder of dark glass when watching it far off in the replays. It's rarely noticeable, but it is there. Now, when it comes to performance, the PS4 and the Xbox bounce around below 60 frames per second, trying to hit it while the extra power in the PS4 and the Xbox One seem to be aimed at getting that to be a far steadier balance, hitting 60 most of the time. I would have loved to have seen all these be locked, but overall, it still works really well. Lastly, let's discuss VR, because my god. First, despite the blurriness that exists inside the PSVR headset that I've at times liken the resolution to splattering two cans of tapioca pudding on your face and then doing a bird box challenge, these guys got it almost completely right. First, the instruments. With some deft programming and design, they're all readable easily, which in some games that actually isn't true. Additionally, it has the easiest and most carefree sense of immersion I've seen in most video games that have any kind of VR component. Because when you blast in the clouds like you're trying to start your own weather pattern based on the main Lomkovic maneuver, the water clouds the outer canopy in amazing droplets. Think the effects of the Metro series on your goggles and you sort of get an idea here. The world around you escapes into a gray nothingness and then if you continue flying through the clouds, ice begins to layer the edges of your cockpit, further reducing what is basically damn near 2200 vision already. 
And that immersion's increased by adding in this atom-minded vibration of the machines that are currently being pushed by barely controllable rockets anyway. And that increases as you go faster and faster, and you have a sense of immersion that few games and VR systems do. It's no Vive, Odyssey Pro, or Rift, and some of the better VR titles there. But it is stunningly close, and Ace Combat does nothing but improve due to it being in here. It still fights the very low resolution of the VR helmet, make no mistake. But man, it's pretty ace anyway. When it comes down to it, presentation is always this fine balance between the requirements of gameplay and the purgatory of pushing the envelope and how you present your game world. Ace Combat 7 does an incredible job aimed keenly at that main focus. Could the trees look a little nicer? Yes. Could the vehicles have more skins? Yes. And I would have loved to have that locked FPS on the consoles at all times, even though it doesn't drop that often. But my god, it honestly is outstanding to look at, even with those small issues. Sound, music, and voice. Page one, Wilco. satellites that's how come every now and again i'd try to bust out and every single time those damn dogs would drag me right back and let's do music here first so this is pretty good but never really seems to attain the lofty moments of some of the past titles which are hard to hit anyway with a unique flavor all its own though it actually does not get overshadowed in fact it has this subtle flavor to it that at times reminds me of old miami vice tv shows with a snappier percussion and a good amount of symbols with a faster tempo than i originally expected when compared to say some of the starting elements of the top gun score you can see that impressions have carried over from there to here and it works really well I just never felt that even with the ending moments and boss fight style battles, it really nailed the excellence of the prior Ace Combat series. But your mileage is going to vary here, with an assorted series of more dance and techno inspired bits during mission briefs, choosing weapons or jets, it is a well-rounded package throughout. Voice. First, I have found that even with a princess murder plot and a ragtag group of flyers with a vendetta on their mind, the game actually handles the voice acting with a much more sedate feeling than prior Ace Combats, and this helps tremendously. You guys all know the moment I'm talking about where instant energy comes into a conversation and a person goes from, hey man, let's have brunch to you're the murderer of my entire family right at the same second. I like it here. It lets the story settle a tiny bit contained within the bookends of various cutscenes, all handled like newscasts. It does a really good job solidifying the story. Now, in no way am I saying the situation itself is realistic. It's actually far from it. It's just that there's a bit less of a knowing feeling that they're crossing into straight up Nicolas Cage thresholds than the prior titles. There are a couple grammar and sentence structure errors that crept in here, and one that's actually pretty big, you may not even notice it. Overall, it's done well, and it has its eyes set on fully informing the gamer of the situations going on around them. The constant chatter of the battle mates as you take down enemies works really well to progress the story and make the whole thing feel set in a world with a bit more going on than usual. And that brings us to sound. This is excellent aside from one thing that I'll get to at the very end. First, all of the good. When you pull a high G turn, the rattle and the strain of the airframes pushed to their limit creak around you in this perfect surround, or a missile just barely misses you and you can hear its high-pitched swoosh as it jets between your engines and a Tomcat. It is remarkable how well realized this actually is. Now, each jet also has its own distinct sound that reverberates around you, and special care has been made to change up the sonics inside the cockpit for each one with the F-14's wider spaced engines creating this insane cacophony of sound waves all the way to the F-15 and its tighter spacing that has an almost smooth acceleration boom to it. Then you go to the slow flying A-10 that has a dive bomber like whine that screams out when you pull hard on the stick. Explosions work incredibly well to inform you of both your teammates as well as your enemy's demise, as well as hearing those cannons surround you as you're turning and burning trying to get away from an enemy. The one issue I had, though, was a little bit strange. The A-10 sample, just overall the way it sounds, has a noticeable warble to it that gives you this impression it's compressed compared to the others. Now, I was going to chalk it up to the sound mixing, but it did seem oddly presented, and it was noticeable to me. It probably won't be noticeable to you overall, but I just figured I'd mention it. Here, I have to say, sound's incredibly important in all games, but... In a 3D aircraft fighter game, it's going to be vital for you to understand where everybody is and what's going on. This game has so much information in the sound that you will easily find yourself reacting to things you didn't even see simply by understanding what's going on around you audibly. And of course, that brings us to gameplay and a bit about the story. As I said before, you play Trigger in a battle between two of the most oddly named nations I've ever seen. It's a battle that quickly turns into a series of sorties behind, above, and amongst enemy lines as you and your teammates of renegade pilots go out 
and try to stop an ever-growing conflict from getting bigger by blowing literally everyone up. <laughs> I mean, at the first time you enter a mission and they say, man, we need to find out what's going on, kill everyone. It just works really well to embrace the farcical nature of the game. That's the Ace Combat series in a nutshell, though. Put your heroes in jets and just go for it. Each battle, either normal multiplayer or VR, adds credits that allow you to buy new jets and upgrades, like superstructures that can handle more damage, improve turning, longer range missiles, and more. The game spread across 20 plus missions, each with the main campaign, many of them multi-multi-part, with you getting a series of targets to take down or missions to partake in that change as you end up playing them dynamically. Now, sometimes you'll be racing into enemy airspace, slipping through radar-free zones to puncture deep into the heart of enemy lands. Other times, you're going to be slipping ambush-style behind cargo containers on their way to questionable destinations and, of course, lighting them on fire with death from above. What's interesting here is picking a plane is actually important. You have to understand what's going on. Some of these missions overlap different mission types, but if you choose wrong, you will be sorely punished by a much more difficult mission. Take, for example, a mostly ground-based mission. If you get a fragile plane that's more for air-to-air -air because, you know, that maybe reinforcements are going to be in the area, you might find that you're strafing everyone with cannons versus missiles as you didn't pack enough. And you might think to yourself, I'll just pick the plane that perfectly suits the mission. But a lot of these missions have subtle different informations as you end up flying out that could indicate reinforcements are on the way or there might be some change to what you need to do. It's actually very cool and it makes you pay attention to the briefings. But from there, you're pretty much off. And you guys know me, I'm a fan of these kind of games. They single-handedly added turn and burn to my list of good advice. The same list that says don't use a blacklight in your best friend's bedroom. Battles are a combination of building up potential energy so you can outturn enemies while at the same time not stalling out. A high G turn maneuver that you have also allows you to quickly turn inside an enemy's radius, but it burns off speed insanely fast. And if you stall, be prepared to be defenseless even if it's just for a bit as you fight to regain speed. Of course, you always have your basic weapons, but the strategy changes when you pick those special weapons because you might get a missile that almost never misses its target, but you have to get much closer or a missile that's far faster that would require you to sort of guide it in. Guns are there for up close and personal, and I have to say there are a few things more satisfying than gunning down an enemy who think they escaped because they dropped chaff a second before. Now, while most of the missions I really liked, there were a few I had some issues with. The ones I didn't like are the ones with somewhat obscure requirements or ones with timers, and there are a number of them where the timer can really become an enemy in and of itself, especially on the brutally hard difficulty. So keep an eye on that. Each airplane also has its own strengths and weaknesses aside from its overall type. For example, while the A-10 is as slow as that one questionable family member we all have that was born right around the time your brother and sister took a special trip outside state lines, it can actually turn on a goddamn dime and has insane durability. The later planes, some more experimental than others, are all handled well with various unique abilities to them. The Ford swept wing SU-47 is probably my favorite and has this very interesting feel to how it flies compared to the other jets. When it comes to multiplayer, there's private and open lobbies, deathmatch and team deathmatch settings, as well as the ability to keep a game from starting until a certain number of jets join into the game. It's not overly robust, but it's all there. Lastly, there are the VR missions. It is easily one of the best excuses for not wanting PSVR exclusivity than I can remember. That being said, it's also easily within the top three presentations of VR in a game, right up there with Astro Bot, Resident Evil, and Star Wars VR battles. Sadly, they are PSVR exclusive missions for at least one year, and it feels like Sony just sort of threw their money at it to keep it proprietary to the system, because while it is amazing to play in VR, we have another situation like the Star Wars VR missions because they're there, but there's no real promise of more. There isn't much other than a couple new modes in VR, and there's no real constant action mode, which I would have loved. You can fly around in empty space, but that's it, and the VR mode only offers three or four jets available for those missions. It's a Sato mission. It is otherwise an amazing package when it comes to VR, though, and something that if you haven't pulled your PSVR out of your closet for a while, this might be the game that gets you to do it. Now let's talk about control for a second. Usually the change between a sim and an arcade style title is a slickly noticeable spherical difference, easily identified by aircraft that control like a rubber ball on a gimbal in arcade games to a sim's more nuanced flirtation with absolute chaos, especially when trying to control a jet that has thrusters on its ass and for all intents and purposes didn't want to be in the air in the first place. Ace Combat is somewhere in a middle bracket. It's balances between gaining potential energy for turns and maneuvers and stalling out, making you helpless for a moment. And I like that. It's okay that every game isn't a simulation. And for me, Ace Combat nailed the dynamic of an arcade game without being overly punishing or overly lax. The game also fully supports the Thrustmaster PS4 joystick and throttle system, and it works amazingly well. Though to get the high G turn special maneuver to work, you have to adjust a setting or two. But the fidelity offered by it's unparalleled compared to the gamepad. 
Now, as you guys know, when I review a game, I play on all the difficulty modes to see how the game handles going from your Iron Eagle to your Top Gun, and it's pretty measurable here. On easy, most enemies are defeatable with a bit of planning and battle prowess. Normal turns up their maneuverability a bit, and they're more likely to get around on your six. Hard is... <laughs> It's hard, especially when you're balancing a time mission with enemies like a fucking mosquito swarm, ground targets with all these kind of air measures and trying to defend a particular target all at the same time. It really is an interesting mix, and you have to pay attention to the plane type you get, the exact mission briefing and the weapons you bring. Even easy can be a little bit difficult if you mess that up. When it comes to playing the game, you're looking at maybe 12 to 15 hours on normal if you don't make any mistakes, 14 to 20 on hard, though some of the missions can be downright punishing. But when you add in VR, unlocking aircraft parts, there's actually probably another 15 locked in here to gain the money for all the items and the skins for multiplayer and so on for all the planes. Of course, if none of this is fun, who gives a shit how long it is? And that brings us to Fun Factor. I think every kid who grew up in this era wanted to be Tom Cruise turning on their six and hitting the brakes so they'd fly right by. Hell, some of us called our best friends Goose, and for decades, the Ace Combat series has injected that feeling straight into the veins of kids and adults everywhere right through their living room TV. This game is an absolute blast throughout. It can be difficult, so you've got to really watch out what's going on. But I love the mission variability. I love the different ways in which you had to choose what type of airplane you want, what type of weapon you want, and really how you wanted to go about taking out the different enemies because the strategies change depending on which enemies you can take out first. And there's a bit of dynamic feeling to it. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. But there is a lot to enjoy here. So as you guys know, I rate games on a buy, wait for sale, rent, or never touch again rating system. This is absolutely a buy. The game does such a good job focusing the time frame. It was dominated by high-flying movie titles back then, like a goddamn Hulk Hogan-era WrestleMania series, from the Top Guns to your Iron Eagles, even to that shitbird movie Nick Cage made called Firebirds, which had him chasing Sean Young around before she went batshit insane and filmed it live on The David Letterman Show. I think it's really harder to hit an arcade title than a lot of people think, especially one that's going to offer an extended period of gameplay without getting boring or overall taxing when it comes to the repetition. Here, at least for me, it never once hit that moment, and that is something I can't say for a lot of other arcade games out there. So anyway, that's it for me. I hope you guys liked the video. If you did, maybe follow me on Twitter, Reddit, Twitch, anything you can. I'm ACG on Twitch there. Of course, I would love for you to give me a follow on any of those places. I also have an Instagram. And if you want, you can become a patron on the Patreon website, which allows me to give you guys reviews that aren't two minutes long or filled with sponsored bullcrap. And it always helps, especially in this era where everything I upload gets demonetized for some reason or another and all the weirdness that goes with YouTube. Becoming a patron or subscribing to me on Twitch absolutely helps in ways I cannot easily explain to you. Anyway, that's it for me. Hope you guys liked the video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down. Peace out and enjoy the rest of your week.